chapter 11. I'm going to go ahead and read um, just a few verses, but we are going to try to get through the 14 verses that this story um, encompasses. Revelation chapter 11, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It would read something like this in your Bible. Then I, I'm adding Peter, was John. John. <laughs> Wednesday night I couldn't, I couldn't get Peter and Paul straightened out. So now I'm, I'm adding Peter. So it just, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court of the uh, the court which is outside of the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth and the, all the plagues as often as they desire. May God bless the reading of his word. So there's a lot to talk about here. And first, I want to give you some background as to where we are. We find ourselves in what I call the halfway point of the seven years of tribulation. Three and a half years of tribulation have come. We find ourselves at the halfway point and being ready to usher in what's called the great tribulation or the second half of the seven years of tribulation. So you have three and a half years that have passed, we're now at the breaking point, there's going to be a change, there's going to be a, a um, clear um, earthly response to the first three and a half years, and then we have the great tribulation. And I have explained to you um, quite a few times to, to remind you of the role of the Antichrist. It is my belief, without a shadow of a doubt, that during the first three and a half years, the Antichrist, a human entity, a man, um, through the power of Satan and his forces, gains a, an amazing amount of strength and admiration and love. And in the process of his gaining strength, um, he sets out as his mission to rope in the nation of Israel. He wants to love on them. And part of his love for them is to give them back the land that they have been fighting for for so many years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, to give them back the land that they have been fighting for for so many years. He re rebuilds the temple to what you guys are up in 203. Sorry. Um, nobody really knows about all these changes. But to give them back the temple that they have been longing for, uh, if you, you understand what's going on today, that temple ground um, is part of the Muslim owned territory. And the, the, the dome, the gold dome, is, is the location of the temple grounds that has been handed back to um, Muslim, 
control, and it's currently a mosque. Um, but this Antichrist gives them back their temple. And he restructures everything as to the way it's to be, and he is their hero. In the midst of all the world chaos, because of the judgment of God, he, he comes and he's the shining light. So, out from the midst of that, come two witnesses. The first two verses are very interesting to me, and I'll talk about them. I don't want to miss them, per se. But the, the main crux of this is these two witnesses. And unfortunately, there's a lot of um, differences of opinion when it comes to the timing of their ministry. Some say that these two witnesses represent the latter half, the great tribulation, the second part of the seven years of tribulation. I don't agree. I believe that their ministry is being culminated. It's finishing right now with this story. Remember, I have told you over and over again that there's a lot of people who don't agree that this book is chronological in its layout. I am one who believes that the chronologic order of this is clear. You have the seven seals, then the seven trumpets, then the seven bowls, all happen throughout the span of the seven and a half years. So the seven seals have occurred, the six trumpets have occurred. If you remember, we were talking about this. So right now we're in that sixth trumpet stage before the seventh angel is about to sound right here in verse 15. And then you have the, you're in the midst of the break and then you have the seven, seal, seven bowl judgments which represent the great tribulation. So I believe in a chronological layout. Why am I saying all that? Because you may read somebody who talks about these two witnesses as being already preparing for the second half of the tribulation. I don't believe that. So with that said, let's go ahead and lay it out for you. Now, is that a, is that a sticking point where we should really, you know, no, it, it really doesn't matter. But I'm just, I'm, I'm continuing our series so that you guys understand my position on this and that I respectfully disagree with those who say, um, for example, this scenario happens during the last or the latter part of the tribulation. You with me? Okay, so let's begin and let's talk about what happens in the um, first two verses. Then I was given a read like a measuring rod. They used to use these bamboo reeds that were very hard and hollow and they could maneuver them and they would um, get the measurement of these rods or reeds and let's say it was four foot long and they could then measure using this four foot piece of bamboo that was very straight, very sturdy and it was the tools that they used. Obviously we grew up using tape measures, now they have uh, laser measures and all kinds of things, but this is what they used in that day. He said, then I was given, this is John speaking, a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. I'm going to stop right there. There are a lot of people who will, you will read their commentary and they try to over-spiritualize this. Like, oh, the, the, the author, John, is talking about the church, and, and we're going to measure the church. Stop it, okay? The church, first of all, is immeasurable. Because how do you measure humans? You, you don't do that. This is a building. He's talking literally. You guys are, in, you guys are upstairs. <laughs> upstairs, 203. Sorry, I should just close that door, but then they'll all come. <laughs> um, so he's talking about the actual temple the temple that the antichrist built during the first half of this tribulation period 
And now he asks for John, the angel, for John to measure it. What does measuring the temple represent? Well, super simple. It represents two very important things. One, it's preservation and the ownership. Can you imagine somebody walking in your house, knocking on your front door and say, yeah, I want to measure your house. Hold off. Unless I ordered an appraisal or something to be done, and I'm, you know, I'm responsible and I ordered it as the owner of the house, nobody's going to come in and measure my house. So measuring represents ownership. So God is reminding us that even in the midst of such decay and, and all the mess that's going on, and remember, the temple had been used rightfully during the first three and a half years. It's about to change. It's about to, to, to totally go against the things of God. But for the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is loving on the Jews and giving them what they want. So they're worshiping on the Sabbath in the temple the way it used to be. So then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and I angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God. What is the temple of God? Well, most would believe that that's the holy place. You have the holy place and then the holy of holies. That was the common ground. Now, if you, there's two things you must understand. One is there's the tabernacle of the Old Testament and then the temple of the Old Testament. Now, I need my board. Um, so you have the, the entrance of the tabernacle where they had the brazen altar. And in order to enter into the tabernacle, you had to offer a sacrifice. So to enter into the tabernacle, the open area of the tabernacle, you had to offer a sacrifice, and then only the priests were allowed to enter the holy place, and only the high priest was allowed to enter the holy of holies. When the tabernacle, when the temple was built, they wanted to copy the tabernacle, but they also wanted a place for people to come and visit. So they built the tabernacle in the center of the temple grounds, and then on the outside of the, the, the copy of the tabernacle, they would build what's called the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles where, where, is where everyone would go and gather on the outside, but if you were a Jewish man about to do business with God, you would want to enter into the inner court or the tabernacle type environment. And in order to get in, you needed to bring a sacrifice. You're with me, right? I'm, I'm trying to draw, and again, I don't have my, my board with me, unfortunately, but I just paint that picture. So he asked him to measure the temple of God the holy place, the altar, which you would have to go into the holy place. You have the outside area, brazen altar, the laver where you wash your hands, and then you go into the holy place where there was a three pieces of furniture, the altar of prayer, the table of showbread, and I'm looking at it from the front towards so the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies is this way. I walk into the holy place. It's, it's a good, this is a good characterization of it. You walk into the holy place, and on the right is the table of showbread. On, in the center, right before the curtain to enter into the Holy of Holies, was the altar of prayer. And to the left was the candelabra, if you will, uh, the menorah, whatever you want to call it, that would give light to this room. So this is the furniture that was here. And he tells him, men, mention, uh, mention, measure the holy place and then measure the altar area. Why? He's reminding us he has ownership of these two areas. God is still in control. Even in the chaos, he's still in control. And what reminds me about, what this reminds me of is you think things are bad now? Well, during the tribulation, Things are going to be a whole lot worse. We're not going to be here. We're going to be in heaven celebrating the, the, the wedding feast. But on earth, it's going to be a whole lot worse 
than you could even imagine. If you think it's bad now, and it's bad, it's bad. I, I have a major problem with a country that celebrates one day to commemorate the fallen soldiers and one day for labor and one day for veterans and one day for the celebration of the birth of our country, July 4th, and they celebrate Gay Pride Month for a whole month. Got a problem with that. We're, we're backwards in our thinking. Who's in control? A whole month. Anyway, I've been really good the last few months. I've been really, really trying to keep myself in line. So I'm very proud of myself. Anyway, so he, he, measures, he measures the temple. He measures the altar. And then he says, the angel tells him, but leave out the court which is outside the temple. I just told you about the court of the Gentiles. So he says, leave out the court of the Gentiles. Don't count them. Don't measure them. Because he says in the verse 1, he says, measure the temple of God and the altar and measure or count, count those who worship there. So there is still, in my humble opinion, a remnant of, of people in the midst of the tribulation seeking God's face, seeking to worship God, asking for forgiveness. Why is he, why is he measuring the altar? Because that is the place where their prayers would be lifted up and their prayers represent requests for forgiveness. You see how I'm painting this picture for you, okay? So he said, measure the temple, measure the altar, and count the people that are worshiping. Count the remnant. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they, the Gentiles, will tread upon the holy city underfoot for 42 months. You see this announcement that just took place. He said, don't measure the Gentile court. Don't worry about them. They're about to take over this temple. They're about to try to destroy it. They're about to turn this place into the abomination of desolation. They're about to change this place from a place where we worship God to a place where multiple gods are worshipped and blasphemy is to take place. The Gentiles will soon trample this city and this place for the next 42 months. Anybody can guess what 42 months represent? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. So he is announcing to John, the revelator, that don't worry about the Gentiles and the court there because they're about to take over this temple. I'm trying to figure out who's, who's the remnant. And in the meantime, the Gentiles are going to take over this temple for the next 42 months. You're with me so far, right? And then it says, and this is where it gets confusing, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed, clothed in sackcloth. What is 1,260 days? Three and a half years. 42 months. All the same, just a different way of, of painting it. Now, so because of this passage right here, and this verse, most not most. About half of the commentators believe that he is talking about a forward move. That he's talking about the next 42 months. So the, the next 1,260 days. But he is talking about this that is about to take place. Now what am I talking about? He is going to show John why... He didn't want to measure the Gentile population. He's about to show him and give him a clear example of what happened that caused God to say, measure this, but not that. You with me? Trying to break it down so you understand it. Okay, so he says, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days closed in sackcloth. These... Two witnesses are two olive trees. If 
you know anything about scripture and about how it all works. An olive tree represents, or the oil that the olive tree then provides upon the squeezing of the olives, olive oil, represents, will always represent in scripture, the Holy Spirit. So he is saying to us, these two witnesses are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they are two lampstands. Two lampstands. A lampstand is something that bears testimony in extreme darkness. If you want to see a picture of all of this, this chapter in Revelation, you got to go back to the days of uh, Zechariah. Zechariah's prophecy in the fourth chapter, you'll see this idea of these two witnesses. A lot of commentators, and first of all, I, I, I didn't want to bypass, I was going to mention, the end of verse 3 says that they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a, um, is a garment worn during mourning. When, when the people were mourning something, they did two very important things. One, they would wear sackcloth. <laughs> Um, anybody know what burlap is? Um, they used to deliver the potatoes in these potato sacks, right? That, that was like burlap. It's, if you touch it, it's really... So people would make um, clothing out of what we could relate to as sackcloth, but it was really camel's hair. And camel's hair was very, very thick, very... You know, just didn't feel like sandpaper. So they would make these clothes out of camel's hair during their time of mourning because every time they would move, it would be incredibly uncomfortable and it would remind them that they're in a time of mourning. That's what the purpose of wearing sackcloth was. Now, if you know about mourning, they would also have ashes and they would pour ashes on their head because it wasn't about beauty, it was to remind them of this time of remembering that they have just suffered a loss. So these two prophets, these two men of God, were dressed in sackcloth, a, a symbol of mourning. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and sent with a message Two lampstands sent with a message of light in the midst of all of this darkness. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and they devour their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. The person who tries to harm them. So while they are in full ministry mode, they were indestructible. They were superheroes. They were Batman, Spider-Man, all of these Avengers, all of them combined because they had the power of God. And while they were in full ministry mode, they were literally indestructible. And if anyone would come against them, if anyone would try to stop them from prophesying, if anyone would try to silence them, they would literally be destroyed at the words of their mouth. Now, I don't believe for a second that fire came out of their mouths. I don't believe that. There are some who would say, yeah, if I, no, I, I believe that their words were so powerful that if they said, hey, you're done. That'd be pretty cool, right? Oh man, all the people I would think of. No, just that's a dangerous gift to have. Anyway, so these two, these two had the power in their mouths to just speak a word, and they would be devoured. Anybody see the Raiders of the Lost Ark when the 
when they finally, at the end of the movie, they finally open the ark and Indiana Joe says, don't look, don't look. And they close their eyes and they don't look and everybody else is looking and the power of God in this movie sends a whirlwind and everyone is destroyed and evaporated by the power of, of this Holy Ghost fire, if you will. If you've never seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, believe me, it's, it has a lot to do with Scripture and the power of the Lost Ark of the Covenant. Anyway, that's what this reminds me of. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth, the mouth of the two witnesses, and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These two have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So you read this, and many commentators now say, oh, this must be Moses and Elijah. Just must be. Because you think about Moses and Elijah at the, at the Mount of Transfiguration, those are the two that came back to have a conversation with Jesus, and Peter wants to build altars there because this is an awesome moment. Here you have the Son of God, and next to him you have Moses representing the law, and you have Elijah representing the prophets, and they show up. So these two witnesses must be Elijah and Moses. I don't know if I agree with that. But what's the argument here? I believe it's Zerubbabel and Joshua. Now, not Joshua from the book of Joshua, Joshua the priest during the days of Zechariah, Zerubbabel and Joshua were the two that were led, okay, when, when they were given permission to go back in during the days of Nehemiah, during the days of Ezra, during the days of all this time, the nation of Israel who had been scattered were now allowed to come back to their home under the Medo-Persian Empire, they were allowed to, to come back and stake their land. And under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua, the priest of that day, they were to rebuild the temple. You with me? And they, too, went against a lot of opposition. But God favored them. God blessed them. God allowed them to do many miraculous things in the midst and get that temple built. And then comes Nehemiah, who said, hey, why can we have a temple and a city, and if we don't have walls around it protecting it? And Nehemiah went back and gathered his people, and in 54 days, they rebuilt that city. That's how God showed up. Now, could it be Moses and Elijah? Okay, it, it doesn't matter. But God sent two messengers with mighty powers, and then... Verse 7, here's where it gets gooder. When they finish their testimony, please note what it just says. And when they finish their testimony, around the midway point of this wonderful revelation, this time of tribulation, when they finish their testimony, when they finish their testimony, up until then they were indestructible. And now, and now, their job was done, their function had ended, and now they stand at the mercy of what's about to happen to them. By the way, there's a lot of argument. Who killed Jesus? Was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? Who killed Jesus? I'm here to tell you, no one killed Jesus. He laid down his life. Amen. Because in my humble opinion, he also was indestructible until it was time for him to lay down his life. And these two witnesses remind me of the same exact blessing. They had finished their testimony. And the beast, who's the beast? The Antichrist. The beast is now ascending into his full power. He's got everything under his control. All the nations, at least the ten big nations are reporting under his control. And he is rising up. And these two witnesses had made everyone who was under the control of the Antichrist very, very upset by their words. So the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit and will make war against these two witnesses. 
and he will overcome them and he will kill them. And because of the actions of these two witnesses, verse 8 says, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city I'm gonna, I, I can tear this verse apart. And the dead bodies will lie in the street of this great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. This city, Jerusalem, is now being compared to Sodom because of its pride, its indulgence, its prosperous ease and indifference to the needs of others. And Egypt, because of its idolatry, persecution, enslavement to sin, and unrighteous morals. And because of the hatred of the people of the Antichrist, they do not provide a proper funeral for these men. They leave their bodies in the streets. And, and if I were to if I were to, in my spiritual sanctified imagination, I would think that those two bodies are a bloody mess because the Antichrist wants to destroy them so badly that he wanted to make them a spectacle. And in the midst of all of their power, during the first three and a half years, he now wants to make them a spectacle to make the final nail in the coffin of planet Earth and say, you see, I even have power over God's witnesses. And he leaves them a bloody mess on the streets. And every news station all over the world has a camera focused on these two dead bodies. And every analyst and every political pundit and everybody is explaining what these two bodies represent. And many of them, if not all of them, because the good ones are gone. You with me? The rapture, gone. So those that are left are liberals. <laughs> the joke. So, so the news pundits are all explaining why these bodies were being disrespected and why they were being left there and how good it is to show a sign of force and to show a sign of power. And this Antichrist knows what he's doing. And this new king, whatever you want to call him, this new beat, whatever you want to call him, he is showing that he's in control. Every camera is pointed on them and their 24-hour views and everyone can watch all of this and all of this is taking place and this city has become Sodom and Egypt. And then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies in for three and a half days. Now, it is believed, three and a half days, literal days, these bodies are laying in the street. Three and a half days. Decay, um, blood, worms have developed. All, all, listen, three and a half days for a dead body without being taken care of and, and prepared for burial is an ugly thing. So it just continues to add to this picture. And I want you to have this picture in your mind. This picture is important to what we're about to explain to you. And those from the people's tribes, tongues, all over the world will see these dead bodies on camera, on computer. They will, this will be the new, man, there will be so many millions upon millions of viewing this website that shows these bodies. And they will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who left or who dwell on this earth will rejoice over these two dead bodies. They will rejoice so much so 
and they will make merry and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So if you will, they establish a satanic Christmas. Because when you talk about giving gifts to one another, yes, we do it on birthdays and yes, but for the whole nation to do it, it's Christmas. Let's be honest. It's Christmas. And they take the death of these two witnesses and they celebrate it so much so because of their hatred for them and because of the, the, the way they were rebuked by their preaching, they now celebrate the death of these two prophets by giving gifts to one another and rejoicing and drinking and being merry and having a feast and saying, yes, we won. The Antichrist should be praised. Yes, he is in charge. You ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into these two witnesses. And they stood on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And it says here, my Bible says, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. Now I painted a picture for you a moment ago about the horrible nature of their bodies on the ground. And every camera was pointed at them and they were celebrating and giving gifts and made a satanic Christmas out of this whole thing. And now all of a sudden, while everybody was watching... Not at midnight, not at 3 a.m., right in the middle of the day when the largest crowd was watching this spectacle. The breath of life from God entered them. Every wound was closed. Everything that had been decayed and marred and bloodied was put back. And all of a sudden, while they're lying there, the people who were watching saw this. Now, I don't have much time, but I'm going to tell you something. I would bet you everything, I would stake everything on that's exactly what happened Easter Sunday morning. Saturday, the demons and Satan were throwing a party because Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, was dead and buried. And in the realm of the demonic forces, they were shouting, We win! We win! He's dead! He's dead! But bright and early that Sunday morning, even before the sun came up, somebody knocked on the door of Satan and his board and said, we got a problem. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. These two witnesses, watched by the entire world, and, and you and I both know that's a definite possibility. You can log into lions in the savannah. You can log into elephants in, in their habit. You can log into anything on the internet, anything. And they have 24-hour cams on these bears eating salmon in the river. All of it. Look it up. It's all there. You can watch it. <laughs> and that's what these people were doing. And God blew his breath into their lungs, restored their bodies. But it doesn't end there. It says, and they stood to their feet. Whew, hold on. 
they stand up. And, and my Bible says, everyone who was watching, I don't want to use a cuss word, that would be disrespectful, but everyone said, O-S. O-S. They know. They know. They know that they're in trouble now. These guys who were, would speak a word and someone, their enemies would die. Imagine how they're going to react when they come back to life. Oh, snap. <laughs> Fear came upon all of them. But that wasn't the message of God. God didn't want to act in vengeance with those two. So it says, everybody's watching. Now, forget it. You're calling your, not you, not us, but the world is back. calling them. Hey, Susan, watch the camera. Hey, oh, something's going on. Hey, you got to watch this. Hey, it's happening. Fox News, CNN, everybody breaks out live. There's nothing you can watch on TV with, without breaking news, without everybody showing. Every, even ESPN is going to show what's going on in Israel right now with these two lives that are coming back because they're waking up after three and a half days. Great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice. Who's they? Everyone. Everyone now. Here's a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come on up here. Wow. Then all of a sudden, a Lamborghini. <laughs> in the form of a cloud. <laughs> Pulls up right next to them. That's what, hey, listen, I'm just, listen, that's what's here. All of a sudden, a cloud comes and pulls up right next to them. Everybody's watching. Sees what looks like a cloud. And these two witnesses climb up. And they're standing on the cloud. And all of a sudden, Again, my sanctified imagination has them going. <laughs> Watch what the next three and a half years is going to bring. Get ready. All we tried to do was to get you to, to understand who Jesus was. See you later. See, my, my, my vernacular would be, see you suckers. <laughs> and it says, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. Just in case you didn't think God was serious. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. In Jerusalem and a tenth of the city fell in the earthquake 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven now let me let me just say to you that I don't believe that when you hear the term gave glory, I don't want you to misunderstand. I don't believe this was genuine worship. I believe it was a grudging admission to the power of God. I, I believe the people had to say to themselves, must have been God. God showed his power. Why did we mess with God? But when it talks about giving glory, we would think of it, oh, God is holy. God is, oh, no, no, no. It's not worship. It is begrudgingly giving him, God, the last word. 
You with me? So in the midst, as, as these two witnesses are waving goodbye, and, they're, and the camera is following them like if it was the space shuttle. You know, you, come on, you know what I'm talking about. And they got, they zoom in. Are these real? What, what's the, you know, and everybody's trying to figure it out and all the analysts are calling in. Yes, this is what I believe it is. Yeah, listen, all they need to do is read the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation to know what it is. Read it, read it, read it, it's there. And these angels are escorted, these two witnesses are escorted into glory and every camera is on them. And just to show that God is still in control, all of a sudden the earth where they were, the city, the tabernacle, the temple begins to shake. So much so that a tent, 7,000 of the residents of that city, Jerusalem, are killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven the second woe is past behold the third woe is coming quickly and all I've got to say is woe woe do you understand why I love this chapter in this book? This, this is it. This is, this is where God says, all right, gloves are coming off, you guys. I'm, I've had enough. I've had enough. Remember in the days of uh, the children of Israel leaving the desert land, and they kept giving Moses a hard time, and God said, I've had enough. And Moses said, please, please, no, no, please, I'm, I'm begging you. Yeah, I'm frustrated with them too, but please, no, I'm happy enough. I'm done. And no one above the age of 20 was allowed to enter the promised land because God cut them off. The tribulation is the identical result. Let me explain something to you. The journey from Egypt to the promised land should have taken them 40 days. 40 days. Yet they wandered for 40 years. I think God is worth obeying. I think God is worth listening to. I think God shows here his, his unbelievable, majestic power in the life of these two witnesses who had a story to tell when they got to glory. I can't wait to meet those two when they get to glory and say, hey, did it really go that way? <laughs> the power of God, the control of God, the ownership of God. And I'm here to tell you today, listen, you're going through something that seems out of your control. It's not out of God's control. It's not out of God's control. He is still on his throne. He is still all powerful. And he still loves you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of this unbelievable lesson. We thank you for the clear picture that you have provided through John the Revelator of this experience that these two witnesses will encounter. We thank you for their ministry. We thank you for their power. And we thank you that you, in your calendar, when their ministry was up, through what the world thought they had control over, you proved that you're still in control. And Father, I just pray for this country today. I pray for the mistaken ideals that we have taken upon ourselves. I pray that this country would come to repentance and recognize that we were created one nation under God. And 
Father, I beg forgiveness for this country who has tried to take you out of everything that they do. May this country repent and recognize, just like in this wonderful chapter of the book of Revelation, recognize that you are in total control. And there's nothing that happens without your authorization. And for that, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, we pray all of these things. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.